Everyone, thank you so much for having me and a couple of my friends to join you today. As Ron mentioned, my name is Katie Heritage, and I am the Global Leader for Amazon Web Services Education Technology Accelerator, AWS Ed Start. I am delighted to be joining you all today from sunny South Carolina. I'm sorry I'm not there with you all in person, but hopefully I'll be able to meet with you guys all very soon. Today I'm going to be joined by three of my fellow Amazonians, and collectively the four of us will share information about the current trends we're seeing in education and provide some hypothesis on what's to come in the coming months. So, with that said, here is today's agenda, the content. This is an exciting event and one that I am thrilled to support. Angel Beat does an amazing job of bringing together factual, relevant, and timely information to its customers like you guys through well-crafted events. Over the course of the next 50 minutes, my colleagues and I are gonna introduce you all to three trends that are emerging in the global education market. These are trends that we have seen firsthand from our work with customers around the world. Hopefully, by the end of the session, you'll have a greater understanding of the current trends shaping global education, as well as a greater understanding of what AWS is doing to help customers like you all. So with that said, let's jump into today's presentation. 2020 will historically be known as the year that fundamentally changed education. Undoubtedly, you guys have all been impacted and we've witnessed a rapid shift in how teachers deliver content, how students interact with their peers, how universities have pivoted from campus-based models to online learning environments, and so much more. Never in the history of education have we witnessed such a rapid shift. Today, we recognize that 2020 profoundly changed the way that every industry does business. Education felt that more dramatically than most when it had to shift from traditional in-person education models to an online remote learning environment pretty much overnight. In a matter of days, content had to be adjusted from live group activities, they had to be redesigned, infrastructure had to be developed, and the way people fundamentally learned and taught changed. For some learners, these adjustments were so unnatural, they had to learn how to relearn a new way. As a global leader for AWS Ed Start, I was able to help some of our most innovative ed tech customers swiftly pivot their business models to support their customers during these challenging times. I work with founders who launch new products overnight at the request of customers like yourselves. Today, we're seeing a new normal emerge. And as we progress into 2021 and eventually into 2022, we're going to see an even newer new normal emerge. The education industry has realized so many benefits of this new normal, and we're not going to regress into the previous model. We just can't. As we proceed, we will realize even more how much technology is impacting us. Because of this pandemic, technology will play an even more pivotal role. We're moving beyond the previous standard models of teaching, and entire curriculum and learning methodology, methodologies are shifting into an online presence so that we can reach any learner anywhere at any time. This is so exciting to me and my fellow Amazonians. Learning, curiosity, and education are core to our values at Amazon. Just like Ron mentioned at the very beginning, this is something that we're really passionate about. In fact, we even have a leadership principle called Learn and Be Curious that states, as you can read on the screen, learners have never done learning and always seek to improve themselves. They're curious about new possibilities and act to explore them. We're in a rapidly changing business environment. And in order to stay nimble, people themselves have to be intellectually nimble. Listing Learn and Be Curious as its own leadership principle elevates and clarifies the critical role that learning, self-development, and curiosity play in being a successful contributor and a strong Amazonian. Our commitment to education can be seen throughout our organization. It's not just a passion that we have or some words on the wall. It's actually something that we live and we breathe every single day. For example, Amazon has a career choice program. 
We believe that everyone should have the opportunity to learn new skills and build their career. Career Choice is an innovative program uniquely designed to upskill our employees who are interested in pursuing futures outside of Amazon in a variety of on-demand, or excuse me, in-demand careers like transportation, healthcare, IT, and trade skills. This is just one of the very many examples of the programs that Amazon offers internally and externally that demonstrate our thirst for knowledge that keeps us growing and that fuels our business and our innovation. Your business is education. You all are committed to your students, your campuses, your teachers. You guys are committed to revolutionizing education. So combining our deeply rooted passion for education and your mission to advance education, we can solve problems quicker, allowing you to more easily support your students and deliver upon your mission. As the leader of AWS EdStart, I've had the pleasure of working with many ed tech companies, K-12 school districts, higher ed institutions around the world who are leveraging the cloud to bring innovative solutions to their campuses. I get to meet fascinating founders, university presidents, and teachers alike, and I get to see emerging trends firsthand through their experiences. I'm inspired every day at how fast our customers are implementing new technology in the education sector. Throughout 2020, I've observed exponential advancements in research and increased focus on workforce development, rapid cost, uh, cost optimization. All three of these are emerging as new trends. So let's dive deeper into each of these trends to see exactly what is shifting, how we can expect, expect the trend to progress over the next year, and how your organization may be impacted. So, with that said, let's dive deeper. I want to introduce you to one of my friends, Dr. Andrea Pierce, who's our US leader of research. Andrea, do you mind coming on screen and talking to us a little bit about research and the trends you're seeing? Sure. Absolutely. And thank you, Katie. Thanks for the introduction. Also, thank you, um, you know, to Angel Beats for inviting me to join this event today. As Katie mentioned, I lead the research team at Amazon Web Services. And basically, we are part of the higher education group. My team is really focused on acceleration of scientific discovery, basically looking at the time from investigation and data analytics all the way to actual application of science in our everyday life. So just a little bit about my background. Uh, in the past, I have conducted academic research myself. That was followed by um, holding a variety of roles in industry, including the pharmaceutical industry and the technology industry. So because of that, I'm actually really excited today to join you to discuss not only current and future tra trends in research, but in some way those trends reflect my own personal journey in this growing relationship between different research disciplines and computer science. So if we start talking a little bit about the new world of research, on this slide, you see a couple of quotes and things that people have said about how the pandemic has in some ways take us into the future. And I do believe that the past year has been very challenging, but one of the things of having all those challenges is that as with any other challenge, it has also led to some positive changes in the way that we do things. And more specifically, since I'm talking about research, the way we do science. So these changes will carry benefits into the future. And when we stop and listen to what our customers have to say, whether it's research IT, researchers, uh, the, the research institutions themselves, we start to see a number of different themes come to the surface. And while there are many of them, I do want to focus on three for the sake of time. So we'll talk about some of the three current and future trends that really have us thinking about how research is transforming like never before. So first is these, uh, there is an increased interest in technology and computational sciences. There is also increased collaboration across physical geographic and institutional borders. 
as well as data integration that blends research and workforce education. When we talk about the first one, which is the increased interest in technology and computational sciences, it's important to understand that it isn't just an increased interest in the degrees associated with them, but also in the skills that are basically in demand to be able to adapt to this new technology normal. So when we think a little bit about the impact that the pandemic had on a number of projects in research, projects that required face-to-face -face interaction or required an actual presence in a laboratory. Uh, it, it wouldn't be surprising if I told you that one of the things we hear is that our customers see that there are many students who have started looking at different options when it comes to higher education. That is not, however, to say that the biomedical research industry, for example, which is highly dependent on being in a lab has stalled. If anything, what that has done is that in addition to this increase in an interest in other disciplines, some of which are listed on the slide, and that's obviously not comprehensive, we also see an increase in the understanding of the role that computational sciences has in the field of medical research. So that has become much more visible leading to an increased speed, accessibility, and accuracy of the science. So for scientists, really being able to find new ways to conduct analysis remotely is important. One of the things that comes to mind is um, when you look at the increased adoption of ultra rapid analysis of next generation sequencing data for genomics, for example, or just a number of different computational models that are now in use, um, not only in precision medicine and digital health, but a term that I heard a couple weeks ago that I thought it was really interesting was precision education. So, you know, blends in technology are being seen everywhere, including an integration of artificial intelligence, machine learning in areas of digital humanities. So as the technology takes us further to this art of the possible, it also does something else. It, it takes us into the space where we're transcending our physical borders. And that brings me to my next point, which is the focus on data integration and collaboration across all those borders, physical discipline and the institutional borders. So, Research happens across industries and geographies. And sharing isn't just happening within disciplines, but across those disciplines. There are a number of publicly available data sets online. And this cross-disciplinary research uh, movement, if you will, has really surfaced. I was in a conversation last week with people who are looking at environmental impacts on uh, uh, viral mutations. So that's a clear example of research that has a collaboration between virology groups and environmental research groups. But it doesn't stop there because just as disciplinary clusters appear, there are institutional barriers that are also disappearing. So on the next slide, you will see a quote from the European Parliament Research Service where they talked about a 189% increase in co-author publications. And what that really signals is this realization that we're not bound by our physical space. And that translates to research projects that involve multiple schools, pharmaceutical companies, the food industry, government agencies across multiple countries. And sometimes they're all working together on the same project. So I can't think of uh, some very recent examples that are probably fresh on everybody's mind, like some of the vaccine collaborations. These have happened between commercial entities and even between commercial and public entities. And what this trend has done is that it's highlighted that the ability to safely share across institutional 
and geographical borders is no longer something that we want, but it's really a need. And I know one of my colleagues uh, will talk a little bit more about security later. And, um, and that goes very well together with the idea that these technological advancements are now a need in the research community. As they help us make all the academic innovation and research innovation a reality, it also requires very rapid upscaling. And that brings me to my third and last trend that I wanna talk about. And once again, there are lots of different things that have been happening and each one of these trends, we could probably spend an entire day talking about it to uh, drill down on many other components. But the last one that we will discuss today for the sake of time is the idea that university curricula now is tied to learner employability. So there is a blend of research and continuing education. And when we say learner employability, it's not really limited to students. I, I had a conversation just two days ago where someone said, well, what about PIs? What about you know people that have been um, IT professionals for many years? So of course, all this involves anybody involved in the research process and in, um, in, in education. And what it really does is that brings to light that there is this demand of specialized skills that um, and skills that lead to employability that have become a part of curriculum, moving us closer to workforce impact. So my colleague Pedro will talk a little bit more about workforce enablement. But in terms of research, I wanted to at least point out that when we look at the advances and the blend of the two, it could lead to faster, more sophisticated tools and methodology that will allow us to focus more on the science and less on the servers. And that can only lead to a speed, as I mentioned before, acceleration of science to everyday life. So that's basically what we've seen so far. How does it translate to the future? I don't think any of us can predict the future with 100% accuracy. And, um, but I do believe that it's safe to say that this digital transformation and the connection between research and technology, which some have even called a cultural change to virtual enablement, that they're here to stay. So we are witnessing exponential advancements, greater alliances, shared efforts. They're increasing productivity, speed, and accuracy of scientific discovery. And even as we return to a new normal, and I talk to universities that are talking about going back to face-to-face -face in the fall or travel restrictions being lifted, I don't think all the lessons learned will be left behind. Not to mention that there are expectations now around um, the speed and excellence and continuous improvement that our customers, which includes, you know, include uh, students, researchers, and basically society in general, is expecting of the way that we do science. So as we leverage technology, really embrace this journey into the future of research, I think it will be very important to work backwards from the needs of our customers, whether you're thinking of higher education customers, drug development, geospatial advancements, engineering, renewable energy, um, your own employees, or any other aspect of life that benefits from research and technology. It will be important to consider that more applications are moving to the cloud, that high-performance computing is, is taking hold, and disciplines are becoming more and more complex in forming these research clusters. So uh, uh, my hope is that we'll continue to work together to break the digital divide into what I see as a very bright future. And while I can't predict the future, I do um, hope that some great things will be happening in the years to come. 
And these are some of my reflections on the trends in um, the current and future trends in research and higher education. So thank you, Katie. Back to you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Your presentation reminded me of an AWS Ed Start member in Europe that's helping with COVID research. Uh, their name's LabStep, and they're changing the way scientists and researchers document, share, and replicate their discoveries using the cloud. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, one of the first rapid COVID-19 tests was in the United States used um, LabStep as our platform. So thanks again for, for sharing that. I really do appreciate your insights and uh, contribution to the conversation here. So now let's shift our focus to the second trend that I mentioned, which is an increased focus on workforce development. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to one of my favorite Amazonians, Pedro Marzo. Hey, Pedro, are you ready? I'm ready. Thank you, okay, Katie. Thank you, Katie, and thank you to Ron and Angel Beats for having us. Um, my name is Pedro Marzo, uh, and I lead our education and workforce engagements with individual institutions in the U.S., systems, consortia, as well as uh, statewide implementations of our AWS education programs. Um, in today's presentation, I will share with you some of the exciting work that we're doing with academic institutions from vocational schools and community colleges to, to four-year institutions. And also, I'm very proud to share with you that I'm a product of the very same uh, flexible pathways and, and shifts that I will share with you today. Um, I'm going to go off camera just for bandwidth issues, so bear with me. Okay, great. Here we go. So, as most of you know in the audience, we're in the midst of a titanic shift to the cloud. Here are some numbers that illustrate the speed and the magnitude of this very rapid shift. And there are a couple of reasons that explain why governments, enterprises of all sizes, and academic institutions are moving to the cloud so quickly. The first reason is usually cost. You know, with the cloud, you don't have to have big capital expenditures to buy and maintain servers or data centers. Instead, you pay for IT services as you go. So becoming, turning those expenses into variable expense. And that's usually where the conversation starts. But the real reason why most enterprises are moving to the cloud is the agility and the speed with which enterprises can change the customer uh, experience, including um, learner experience from academic institutions. This set of conditions have triggered what many have coined as a fourth industrial revolution, which is driven by automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and serverless computing. And most of these factors are invisible to us as consumers or learners, but they're touching every aspect of modern life, from how we consume entertainment or we stream movies to how students access education in, in a world uh, post-COVID. AWS has millions of customers around the world, and one of the top requests that we hear from customers in every conversation and customers in every vertical is how can we help them find talent pipelines and IT and business resources who are fluent in all of these new technologies. And as you can see here, in fact, cloud computing has been ranked by LinkedIn as the top skill for four out of the five most recent years. So we have a huge opportunity in front of us. Education has a huge opportunity in front of us. You know, if increasing demand for cloud skills uh, is the problem statement, how, how is AWS helping institutions address this issue, which sounds massive at face value? What can we do in the very short term, but also in the long term, to create sustainable and diverse talent pipelines from both traditional sources like four-year and two-year academic institutions, but also alternative channels? What, what's the role of post-secondary education post-COVID? These were all real issues before March of 2020, and they were part of the conversation with customers. 
But there's no question that COVID has accelerated the urgency to focus on jobs, upskilling, reskilling, employability, and do it in a much more compressed period of time. You know, as Ram Emanuel said, and I'm going to paraphrase him, let's not let a serious crisis go to waste. So we are actually seeing uh, a huge demand from institutions to partner with the industry to make sure that their courses and degrees are sort of future proof. But that's not where we started. Uh, here's a, a statement from a survey from a few years, few years ago that it's actually quite provocative. Uh, and I wanted to share with all of you. Back in 2016, 70% of institutions believed that providing a well-rounded education was more important than developing career skills. Fortunately, these surveys from about five years ago, and I'm very glad to report that the perception between what, in, what industry or education was offering and what learners are expecting has really shifted. And now there's a total alignment to, for institutions to be squarely focused on career outcomes, working backwards from employer needs and partnering with the industry, in this case with AWS, to build flexible programs of study that meet the needs of learners and employers today. So here's some education and workforce programs offered by AWS. This is not a full list, but I wanted to give you a quick snapshot of, of what they are. AWS Academy and AWS Educate work directly with institutions and students to embed cloud curriculum into their programs. And Restart, it's a intensive 12-week boot camp that serves underserved communities and underserved populations and reskills them rapidly to meet the demands um, of employers. We're embedding cloud competencies into the curriculum of institutions creating flexible pathways that allow learners to earn a professional certificate that then snaps into either another certificate or academic credit, kickstarting that uh, person's education and career. In some of these cases, the learner not only ends, earns a badge or a professional certificate, but also AWS certification. And in some cases, institutions are recognizing the previous learning experience for credit, stacking up to a associate degree or a bachelor degree. All of these credentials nest inside of each other and provide the on and off ramps for learners to earn the skills employers are looking for in a specific region. For instance, cloud skills for the oil and gas industry in Texas or data sciences in health services in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, or the UK. So here's a, a very quick snapshot of how we do it, how AWS engages with academic institutions to sort of cloudify the, their programs. We start with very rigorous market research into jobs, uh, KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities, and, um, and skills that employers are looking for in a specific region. We do this by interviewing employers their HR and recruiting teams, and even Amazon recruiting teams in those areas. And then we partner with the institutions to take those inputs, we translate them into the skill and competencies that need to embed it into their courses, and we cloudify their programs. And then we make sure that employers are pressure testing our work from day one to ensure that the pipeline coming out of these programs, it's employable by the local demand needs from day one. So lastly, what does that tell us? What's our prediction for 2021 and beyond? Well, these are the three most important things that we have learned in the last 12 months. First is that employers are not a monolithic group. The needs of small and medium businesses are very different from the needs of a Fortune 500 company, yet all business segments in every vertical are struggling to fill tech jobs and we need to create different talent pipelines for those different types of employers. In some cases it could be 
rapid, intense boot camps. And in other cases, it's required to have an associate degree or a bachelor's degree. So we're investing in all segments and diversifying our efforts to serve all types of employers. The second one is the need for pathways and credentials. Speed matters. And again, COVID has taught us that lesson. And learners, and again, we're using the term learners intentionally to go beyond traditional students, are demanding flexible opportunities to earn the skills and credentials they need to find a tech job at their own pace based on their own demands. And we have, have probably all experienced how this rapid shift in how location doesn't really matter anymore. We may all have colleagues or friends or family who have relocated, but they can still perform their duties regardless of where they are uh, because of COVID. And then the last lesson learned, and again, this is the one that we're super excited about, um, partnering with educational institutions and partner with uh, employers, is that the educational experience must embed experiential learning opportunities from employers. So what that means is that we're embedding employers' projects, um, mock interviews, job shadowing opportunities, internships and apprenticeships in the work that we're doing with institutions every single day. So Katie, that's what we see from, from our side, working with hundreds of institutions around the world. And I would like to pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Pedro. I really appreciate your presentation and the points of view that you bring to the table. I'm sure it resonated with a few of our audience members as well. Uh, Pedro, I have a question for you though. Um, recently, I read an article that was talking about Amazon and um, our commitment to train 29 million learners in cloud computing uh, over the next couple of years. I was shocked and quite humbled by this. I mean, this does tie in directly with our culture of education and curiosity. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and share some information with our audience? Yeah, absolutely. Great point, Katie. So Amazon and AWS are very committed to training 29 million people around the world on technology skills. We, we got to practice what we preach, right? So this commitment is to train 29 million people for free by the year 2025. And we're going to do that through multiple channels. We're going to do that through more than 500 free uh, course offerings that our training and certification team offers on our website. We're gonna do that through specific programs to get learners certified on AWS certificates. We're gonna do that through partners. Um, and we're gonna do that through specific programs like Restart, which I mentioned before, and scaling other initi initiatives like Machine Learning University. So I encourage, the audience if they want to learn more about our commitment to train 29 million people to to visit our website it's a, a commitment we made back in november in partnership with the world economic forum and we will be providing updates on that effort on an ongoing basis you know pedro that's just one of the reasons why i love being an amazonian we think big and we deliver results and i can't wait to see this happen let me know how AWS Ed Start can help because we are we're committed to your success in helping our customers around the world. So thanks. So ladies and gentlemen, now let's shift to our last emerging trend. So rapid cost optimization um, isn't new. However, it has been catapulted over the last 12 months. So let me introduce you to another friend of mine. His name is Tyler Lynch, and he's one of the senior solutions architects um, supporting our enterprise ed tech. What that means is he's basically the big brain in the room. So with that said, hey, Tyler, do you want to take it away and tell everybody what, uh, what we're seeing cost optimization? Sure. Hey, my name is Tyler Lynch, and I'm a senior solutions architect with AWS focusing on education technology. Over the last 12 months or so, I've been helping our customers meet the global demands of COVID and also cost optimize their workloads. As everybody listening can attest, lots of online learning, lots of remote learning has increased the traffic that you're producing and the data that you're producing. So I want to dive into that a little bit. When we talk about cost optimization, it's important to take a step back. 
and look at the continuum of achieving business value with AWS. Often we talk about cost savings, total cost of ownership. How can you save on infrastructure costs by maybe moving your storage, compute, or networking to the cloud? But our research and our customers tell us that there are other areas where we directly impact their bottom line. Staff productivity is one of them. We provide tools for automation for things like patching servers, uh, automatically installing new versions of applications, or software-defined networking. And that automation and that repeatability can free up your staff to do things that are more core to your mission. Additionally, operational resilience. AWS provides mechanisms to provide high availability and disaster recovery, thus improving your SLAs and reducing unplanned outages. Katie, I'm sure you see this all the time in Ed Start, but business agility. Our customers love to take our building blocks of services and compose them together into full feature platforms and products they can bring to market. So we look at this and say, how can you go from concept to minimum viable product to production in an accelerated timeline using AWS services? Right now, what we're really seeing though is a mass migration of technologies and content to the cloud. As customers bring their storage workloads to the cloud for less expensive storage, we're helping them classify that data what needs to be available to your applications and your users in real time? Maybe what can we archive offer and reduce your storage fees? Additionally, our customers are meeting more compliance demands than ever, GDPR, CPPA, and others. And they're looking to Amazon to help achieve their compliance goals with automation. So we have a set of tools there that can help you meet your compliance goals and attest that you're meeting those needs. Um, again, data residency is something that a lot of our customers are facing as their students are global. So we're helping them meet data residency and control as well. Sunday nights is always hard in ed tech. That's, that's when homework platforms really uh, get hit the most. And so we're helping our customers through elasticity. So <clears throat> with AWS, they can scale out when needed and scale back in. Instead of buying, provisioning, and standing up servers for that high watermark, of what that max capacity would be on maybe a Sunday night. So they can use the benefits of elasticity in the cloud to help cost optimize that workload. Most importantly, I think we're seeing our customers adapt cloud financial management as either a role or a group in their company. You can think of this as finance plus technology coming together to monitor, report, and notify on cost scenarios for improvement. For me, that is setting a cultural norm and a cultural standard across your organization to think about the economics of cloud as you're building and deploying. And it's not a one-time event. It's not just because COVID you need to pay attention to this. Uh, a cloud financial management group can help your teams understand this and think about what it is like to build and how do we cost optimize going forward? How can you use your economy of scale potentially? How can you look at different purchase options uh, for servers and compute and storage and databases to really maximize uh, your cost structure. So what I think we're going to see next is a double down on performance efficiency. Our customers know that they need to meet this global demand. And so how can they do that with spending less money? And so we're seeing an increased adoption of Graviton based instances. Graviton is a CPU that AWS designed that provides up to 40% better price performance over current generation x86 chips. With open source software, it often, often ports right over no code modifications. Think MySQL, Postgres, um, with interpreted languages such as Node.js, uh, Python, Perl, those also work. Those are interpreted and they work just fine, often without any modifications. Other languages like Java or .NET Core, again, often port over with no modifications depending on uh, the dependencies behind the scenes. And so we're seeing customers move to this new instance class and new instance type and reducing their costs dramatically, but improving their performance efficiency at the same time. I also think we're gonna see customers have deeper monitoring across their workload from start to finish to really understand where they are underutilizing and over provisioning things like databases, web servers, application servers. And that level of visibility partnered with their cloud financial management team can help them to right size and really eke the most cost efficiency out of that workload while still meeting customer demand that we know is gonna grow. I also think serverless is gonna be a primary destination for new workloads. Customers love serverless. It's pay for what you use and only what you use. But when a workload isn't well suited for serverless, I think more customers are gonna fall back to managed services. Managed services remove the heavy lifting and the undifferentiated operational burden that you might have. 
Uh, our customers tell us that operating Kubernetes is hard, operating any type of Docker swarm is hard. And so they look to us, our managed EKS, which is Elastic Kubernetes Services, or managed ECS, Elastic Container Services, to take away that undifferentiated heavy lifting, to remove that operational burden from their team so their teams can just focus on developing software and getting it out the door. Now, I talked earlier really about how our customers love our building blocks and they like to compose full-blown solutions from those services. But we've also had a lot of customers come to us and say, we really want something that does X. We, we don't want to build it ourselves. And a great example of this is Amazon Connect, our cloud-based contact center that allows for omni-channel contact. Our customers today can stand up a remote contact center in minutes and start taking calls almost immediately. But more importantly, they can start to realize additional value out of that high touch engagement between maybe students and your financial aid. You could use Amazon Transcribe to record that voice and transcribe that voice that, and understand sentiment analysis. You can also use big data and analytics to derive insights from the metadata of those calls and the dispositions of those calls. We're also seeing customers tack on additional AI and ML services for call intercept and self-service. So think a customer calls in or a student calls in, they can ask a bot questions about financial aid, when does classes start, maybe in the times of COVID, I have these symptoms, should I go to class? And we can reduce that time that the agents are actually on the phone, that's you know, reducing your time for agents. If I was to leave you with one thing, the most important thing that you can do as a AWS customer is establish that role or that requirement internally for cloud financial management. Cloud economic awareness and training is something that should be reiterated and done yearly. You should be evaluating your workloads thoroughly to see where you can cost optimize. And if you don't know where to start, that's fine. Reach out to your AWS account team. If you don't know who your account team is, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I am happy to go find that person for you, pair you up. We offer free training and white papers and you know, we believe that cloud financial management is an important part of success, and we want to help you achieve that. Thanks, Katie. Tyler, thanks for sharing that. You guys, Amazon's a frugal company. We're not just frugal for ourselves, we're also frugal for our customers. We want to share this cost savings with you, and Tyler just shared some information about how we're doing that, and how while this has always been part of our culture, it's definitely an emerging trend because of the things that we've seen over the past year and our customers, all of them, and how they've been impacted by this and how they're pivoting. Tyler, you're right. Sundays are very rough with back to school and back making sure that students are ready for that Monday course. And we've seen that prevail through COVID. So I don't think that that's going to change at all, unfortunately. So ladies and gentlemen, Let's dive into the finishing final thoughts. So thank you so much for letting us join you today. Hopefully you have a greater understanding of our passion and our culture and how that passion helps us support you in your mission and the current trends that are shaping global education, as well as a greater understanding of how AWS is helping our customers innovate at the speed of light. As I mentioned at the beginning of the session, this is a new normal. This is how the education real, excuse me, this is how the education industry is realizing the many benefits of this new normal. And we're not going to regress to the previous models. Technology is playing a fundamental role more now than it has ever before. And each of these trends that we've discussed today represent what we've witnessed firsthand while working with our phenomenal customers. In closing, I want to thank you one more time for inviting us to join you. We love working with our customers. We love sharing our knowledge and we love helping you all achieve success. So on the screen, you can see our LinkedIn profiles. Please reach out to us. We do respond, I promise. And we'd love to connect with you guys and continue the conversation. We look forward to meeting you all in person soon and working with you all as you support your customers.